Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. DiscerningHearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the missionaries of charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Father Haggerty, thank you once again for joining me. Thank you, Chris, for having me. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation. Again, I am so grateful, and I'm sure so many out there are, that you have brought this work forward because you've been able to take a look at all of the essential teachings of St. John of the Cross and make them accessible to us because some of the things that he teaches, some appear in the Ascent of Mount Carmel, some of it we find in the dark night. And it can be a little daunting for those who are trying to learn from this great mystical doctor of the church. So thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. In one area in particular, it's in the incipient signs of the grace of contemplation. We have discussed in previous conversation, just the first three signs that you have been able to kind of pull out of both of those primary resources. Do you mind mentioning those three again, just in brief? Sure. And the first sign, again, the the context for St. John of the Cross and opening up this question of early, the, the incipient beginning signs of the grace of contemplation. The context of that is that a person has been giving some dedicated time, you would say at least a half hour in silent, quiet, private prayer. And the common experience of religious life from, you'd say the 1500s onward, has been to use some type of meditative reflection, perhaps using the imagination in some cases more. Some people would be more inclined to a more reflective prayer, but in the best of cases, using the gospel passages, many people read the gospel of the day that will be present at the mass and reflect and do a meditation. So what John of the Cross is going to do then in his very indispensable teaching um, that now is rooted at the heart of spiritual theology, he's going to say that that meditative type of prayer, a reflective prayer, some kind of active prayer of this nature is going to undergo a kind of, uh, it's going to run into a wall. It's going to find itself frozen in, in a certain way, frustrated. Part of that will be a sign of a a contemplative grace that's taking place of God inviting the person to a greater depth of soul in the engagement with the real presence of all Lord. So that first sign is is a primary one, the inability, the incapacity, except by forcing oneself to do this type of active, reflective, or imaginative prayer. The second sign is related to it that the person doesn't go chasing after distractions, that the imagination tends to be incapacitated in a certain way, but it's not as though other things then begin to invade one's attention and prayer as attractive alternatives. So that's closely related to that question of not being able to meditate. It's not as though other things now are uh, very attractive. So, and that would be a sign too, it's worth pointing out if we didn't do it last time, that a person will lose the ability to meditate well if they're losing their attention for God. Other things become more important, can easily have rivals to our desire for God. 
And that would happen in prayer and not be a sign then of growing closer to God. And the third sign is a very primary one of just the drawing up the aridity that a person will experience in their feelings. And most people will go to prayer wanting to feel a love for God. And we that's a very strong human desire to want to love and to experience that love and to know his love in perhaps a state of feeling of some kind. And the third sign is a drawing up of this, a plunge into a certain state of aridity in prayer that can be lingering, ongoing, that goes on, you know, for a long time, say a lifetime, intermittently in one's life. And that's another sign then, and a difficult sign in the early period of the grace of contemplation. It can be confused, as we might have mentioned before, too, that people may feel this is a, a sort of depression. It isn't necessarily indicative of what we understand a psychological depression, but this spiritual detachment of our senses and our pleasure in what used to give us a type of happiness or a fulfillment, it begins to dissipate. And it can be very confusing, can it? Well, especially in the early stage of this, because the person has, if you think about a young religious sister in particular, maybe more so with a woman, where she really does go into this relationship with our Lord with a great experience of love for him. And then that begins to dry up in some manner and the feelings turn off in the experience of prayer. So that surely would confuse a person, the discontent that's now experienced in one's life. And that can seem, you know, at least in the time of prayer, like you said, as a kind of analog to depression. But the reality of this is also that, and John of the Cross is strong on this, and you do see this in real life. I've seen it in missionary charity life with the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa sisters, that that aridity does not sap one's energy and just the opposite. You know, depression is a heaviness, a weariness, very bad depression. A person has trouble getting out of bed, I think. And that does not happen in the grace of aridity. And what God is doing is purifying the soul and people in aridity are being taught by God to allow their will to be the more primary reality of the human person in engaging God and in giving themselves generously to their vocation and their life circumstances. So the need to choose, not just to be swept along by good feeling toward attractive things, but now one has to choose. And aridity can be combined with great energetic, you know, self-giving in one's, one's life, whatever that, you know, entails in one's vocation. But yes, it could be confusing at first, what happened here that my feelings now are seemingly empty of anything pleasant or enjoyable? The fourth sign is important. It's actually in the dark night, it's the second of the three that he talks about. But this fourth sign that by combining our understanding of the Sen of Mount Carmel in the dark night is that painful self-questioning of a person due to this experience of losing those satisfactions because we just don't understand it. Wouldn't you say, Father? And again, uh, John of the Cross is addressing that early experience of the contemplative grace. And it's good to be reminded again to point out that he had much experience with these young Carmelite sisters. He was five years as a spiritual director, confessor in the convent of the Incarnation, where Teresa of Avila was there in the first months of that five-year period with him. And he saw and experienced much of that difficulty of trial for people who were very generous in giving themselves to God and then would plunge into this time of a purifying trial in prayer. And it makes sense that people would say they were in love with God coming through the threshold of religious life in that manner into a Carmel. Then 
undergoing this trial would begin to question themselves and perhaps really dig and and afflict themselves almost in a self-examination. Why has this happened? There must be some fault that has caused this, something I'm not recognizing. Maybe my motivations are full of pride or maybe much more vain than I had realized, or perhaps my obedience is really very self-serving. Or, and there's a tendency then, the self-questioning of this, why this is happening, can lead to a person going through a stage of real scrupulosity then, of trying to figure out, to analyze, to why is this happening, trying different ways to jumpstart again, the life of feeling, especially in one's prayer. So depending on the person, if a person is more sensitive, that could be a, a difficult trial. And without guidance, without somebody explaining what's happening, or without a book perhaps to guide us, you could see where that could cause a, not just a trial, but a really almost a crisis in religious life. And I think that has happened at times. Again, with missionary charity life, which I have much experience with, I think if a person is not guided, they may doubt their vocation at that point because the life is already hard. And then they begin to think, well, maybe this is a sign from God that I don't have this vocation. In fact, it's the opposite. God is now drawing them into a greater depth with him and inviting them to a more will-oriented life which is a life of real, more more supernatural love in their will. It helps us, doesn't it, if we have an appreciation, Father Haggerty, of the difference in what he's speaking about when he addresses an aridity in this type of experience in prayer, as opposed to, as you bring forward that tepid laxity that empties consolation from our soul. You know, when we are no longer engaged Maybe you could help us understand that difference. Well, again, that would be the um, that would be well known or easily identified, examined by one's conduct outside of prayer. It can seem to be perhaps, and John of the Cross, you know, makes the point that tepidity and aridity, or the aridity of graced contemplation, that they seem to be very much similar, and if not alike. But the reality of lukewarmness is that a person then goes outside a prayer and really is not so interested in giving to God. They become more careless about what they're doing, careless about venial sins, about how they speak or what who they speak about. And you know, there's a a relaxing in a bad way of one's focus spiritually. But the aridity that John of the Cross is pointing out, and these other difficulties in prayer, they don't dissipate or empty out, you know, the focus of the person, the desire to give to God. In fact, John of the Cross will say in that fourth sign is the person becomes very solicitous for giving themselves to God. So they're more careful about doing things well, doing things wholeheartedly, trying to jumpstart, you know, the life back perhaps, to the former life of more exalted feeling. And granted, that's a not the best approach to this, but they're actually living perhaps, you know, more generously now. They're giving themselves more to God to try to get back to what they had. In fact, they are doing quite well, and God is bringing them now into a purifying experience in prayer to lead to greater depth. Teresa of Avila and her Carmelites, in the beginnings, didn't necessarily have those spiritual directors that were themselves called to the particular charism of the Carmelite order. So for example, they had wonderful, you know, Jesuit spiritual directors, Dominicans, they had different, even to a certain extent, John of Avila, diocesan priests that would help them to be able to discern and to be able to grow in their prayer life. But Here is Teresa finding John of the Cross, who understands that difference that it makes for the Carmelite in particular, and that 
that can be his articulation is an important aspect of all this, isn't it? That's an interesting point you're making. And but if we expand it even, I think some of these saints, and John of the Cross would be one, are a gift to the church, you know, at certain periods of times, a certain era. And John of the Cross then becomes a very key figure in this life of prayer. And not just for, you know, Carmelite spirituality or their charism of silence and solitude and cloistered life. But what he's going to teach and what we've tried to do in this book is bring together the kind of very explicit manner and organize what has he taught about the nature of contemplative prayer. We don't have that in this kind of concentrated way until John of the Cross arrived. And that century is a, is a very key century you have St. Ignatius of Loyola with the spiritual exercises, Teresa of Avila, the great writings that she wrote, and John of the Cross, who is perhaps the best of it because he is very precise teaching something that then will become useful for anyone who is going to be serious about prayer as, and spirituality, you know, in the centuries that follow. So, yes, I would say he's useful but you would you say even more so indispensable if we are, and again, it does depend on a commitment to some serious practice of silent prayer, some private practice of prayer. And then what we have seen today is many lay people are very committed to some private practice of silent prayer each day. Well, and I'm so glad you brought that forward because one of the reasons I kind of flushed that out again is that for many that are entering into the life of prayer, and I'm talking those who have been called to a lay vocation, and you can see it mirrored also in those missionaries of charity who are living a life of prayer, but are very active in the world that's around them and engaged in service to them, that we will seek out those helps that will guide us into prayer. Maybe it's having the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, for example, and we're moved to grow closer. But as you have written, the journey doesn't necessarily stop with the practice of those exercises that we're called to something deeper. And that these signs that he gives us that we're called to that depth, many people can't identify those. That all that confusion because something's happening, but they don't know what to do with it. And I think that's why it's important that these be really fleshed out. Well, it's helpful. It's certainly helpful to have that available and accessible to us. If we ask, though, the question, you know, what about before St. John of the Cross? We have 15 centuries mm -hmm. before that. And missionaries of charity, who I've seen again and again in so many retreats with them, not all, but some become very prayerful, contemplative souls. And they may have never read a page of St. John of the Cross. And I think, you know, what happened prior to John of the Cross, what happens at times is that people follow the grace, the deeper inclination that God is drawing them to, and they do find their way to the attraction of God, and perhaps after much difficulty and, you know, walking a hard path of back and forth and not knowing what's happening. It's better to have the clear instruction of what's happening at, available to us, then perhaps we avoid some of the injuries and the waiting and the delay and unnecessary suffering in this, not knowing what's happening. It's better to know what, what is happening. So part of the question of, of reading St. John of the Cross is, is he describing things that are inevitably going to happen as part of a growing grace of relationship with God? You know, is it really optional what he's speaking of? And to my understanding and reading him for so many years and with experience of people, again, especially the sisters of Mother Teresa, is there's not an option in this. The nature of God drawing the soul into greater depth of relationship is going to affect prayer itself. And certain practices of prayer that may have been easier for the person, you know, become uh, frustrating because God is going to draw the person into a deeper depth of prayer. 
And some people can make that transition more easily. They don't need instruction. But there are many people who might, I wouldn't say get shipwrecked, but end up held up in some manner because they, they don't make that move. What, what happens also in this is that if a person doesn't adjust their prayer and becomes frustrated, that might be carried outside the life of prayer. And they may go backwards in the life of generosity with God because their prayer life seems to be suffering and they lose interest in prayer because they didn't make the proper adjustment in the beginnings of contemplative graces. So slowly, perhaps, then over some weeks and months, they descend, they go backwards in their life of giving themselves to God, and then that affects their prayer life. So it is important to have this teaching and to be able to recognize, you know, something what's happening here. I think it's important for men who are studying to be priests also, because it's so important in the priesthood that we have men of prayer in the priesthood. And if seminarians learn from St. John of the Cross and then become themselves serious men of prayer, that could be diocesan priests as well as religious, then we're going to affect the church much more. It just enters into all that we do in preaching and everything to encourage people to more serious lives of prayer. I think this is essential absolutely for priests, for deacons, and those who will spiritually accompany others in trying to grow in prayer, because the reason and the emphasis on the first four signs, as you've brought forward in your book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, is that if those four things are present, then that's when the fifth sign when you begin, the soul begins, as you said, gently moving into that relationship with that deeper contemplative prayer. That's, it's a hallmark. You don't want to necessarily rush by dropping everything you're doing before, because there may be other things going on there. But after those four things are kind of identified, that's when the fifth sign comes forward, isn't it? Well, the fifth sign is unique in a certain manner, the quiet drawing inclination of a person to remain quietly with God in his presence, where, of course, faith is very strong now in a person's life, and the awareness of being really in the presence of our Lord himself, of God, the indwelling presence in his presence, if we're praying in front of a tabernacle or Jesus exposed in a monstrance, and this quiet inclination to be drawn in love to him. And at the same time, a reluctance, you know, a, a resistance felt inside to do this active work of reflective thinking. So it's a combination of that, this desire to just remain quiet. And what's happening there, to be quiet with God is not a practice, a deep inclination to just remain with him, to be turning in his direction. And underneath that, a person is being drawn by grace. The will itself is being drawn in longing for God, a longing to love. Maybe not felt, not felt by emotion but kind of a a soul feeling, being drawn in a deeper inclination toward him. And it's an inclination of love for the immediacy of the presence of God to the soul. And again, at the same time, this reluctance, this lack of desire to force oneself back to doing active reflection in prayer. That's this kind of fifth sign that John of the Cross is is speaking of. And it's a positive sign compared to the others, meaning the others cause suffering in the soul. This is a positive sign attracting the person to a different approach to prayer, a different entrance into the engagement with God in that time of silence. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore.
to hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty.